BRICS and its economy has grown tremendously in the last uh, two decades. BRICS obviously is the collection of countries, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, and later on added South Africa. Combined, their GDP was only 8% of global economy in 2000, but in 2017, it captures 23%. And if you look at in the uh, PPP uh, level, which is the purchasing power parity um, measurement, GDP of the BRICS combined is now equal to the GDP combined of the G7 countries. Beyond that, BRICS has also acquired a lot of financial and monetary capabilities through its interaction with the global economy, global finance, and global currency issues, that their capacity, not only in terms of size, but also in terms of ability, is going up. So given that uh, BRICS's presence has been felt in the global economy, and it has an impact on the global governance. For example, BRICS was able to collaborate together in these among the five countries to address some of the inequalities that is prevalent in international financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund, IMF, or the World Bank. By addressing the, the disproportionate quota allowed to be possessed by the European countries and the United States, the BRICS has expanded its capacity, its, uh, its presence in these institutions. And also there are issues such as the currency, where renminbi, the Chinese currency, has been supported by the BRICS to expand in the global economy. So altogether, the presence of BRICS tells us about the global governance in the sense that the more of the equitable distribution of voice and power has to be uh, put in place so that the developing countries would have more say and more, uh, more influence in this, uh, in this age in the 21st century. China's role is very important in the BRICS project. Obviously, China is a disproportionately large economy with the BRICS. If you look at the, on the GDP terms, China's economic size is twice as large as four other BRICS countries combined. So in some ways, China can go it alone, if it really wants to, to address some of the inequalities in the global economy or, or the voice in the global governance. But China sees BRICS to be a very convenient and effective tool, foreign policy tool to use. For China, BRICS is a way to soften its kind of a, a, a threatening image if it is to go alone by itself to address some of these uh, uh, frustrations that China feels about the global governance, China will be seen as a revisionist power. But if China collectively moves with the BRICS, it makes sense for, uh, for them to see China as a, a leader of the third world countries or developing countries, as well as uh, it to be a legitimate power within the global system. So, it, and from the BRICS, other four BRICS countries, non-China BRICS, it makes sense for them because China is where the funding is. So most of the financial resources for new institutions that BRICS has uh, started, like the New Development Bank, China has been uh, a major kind of contribut contributor. Um, so altogether, it's the kind of win-win situation, which is what China wants to, you know, usually likes to talk about. For BRICS 4, it's great to have China on board with the financial capabilities and financial resources. For China, it is nice to be in a group with other countries that represent different regions and represent the, the developing economies altogether. East Asian regionalism that has started to energize since the Asian financial crisis of 1997 has seen the 20th kind of uh, year anniversary last year. 
And there are some maturity in this regional cooperation and also some challenges. The maturity being some of the institutions that started almost 20 years ago, well, some of them 15, are now maturing to be something that's permanent and has a lot of legitimacy. For example, Chiang Mai Initiative, which started in 2000, has evolved into a very solid institution, even uh, the institution for the emerging funding mechanism. And along with it, the AMRO, which is the surveillance organization, has just become an international organization. So this is one example of how some of the maturity is seen among the East Asian uh, regionalism. On the other hand, there are challenges. One side, the major challenge obviously is the humongous and very visible rise of China, which now wants to have its own uh, uh, very uh, strong initiative, like the Belt and Road Initiative, which somewhat overshadows some of the regional cooperation efforts. Uh, also, China wants to do several things bilaterally. Like talking about this Chiang Mai initiative, China also has a bilateral swap arrangement which can you be used to address financial uh, crisis of other developing countries that is partnering with China. So in some ways, many, many wonder if that type of bilateral and China's, uh, China's own initiative might undermine uh, regional, regional cooperation. But so far, no China has shown significant commitment to this uh, regional effort, and Japan is also on board. And now, with Trump coming into place as the American, American leader, East Asia really needs some hedging mechanism in order to make sure that the economic order, the regional economic order, will be uh, guarded by these institutions that has emerged for the last 20 years.